Uh, about a year ago, I fell in with a crowd of marathon runners. And suddenly my weekly six mile, or for those of you who think in kilometers, 10K Saturday morning runs, seemed a bit too short to brag about. So I upped my distance gradually. And during my first or second 10 mile run, I was going along at what felt like a good pace. And suddenly I heard the footsteps closing in on me. So I thought to myself, hmm, if it's a fit-looking person, okay, I won't feel so bad if they pass me. I should tell you that I ran track growing up, and so I can be a bit competitive even about my recreational running. So I hear these footsteps, and a few moments later, I see this expanse of pink spandex and a flash of white hair. And I say to myself, this is not happening. <laughs> I can keep up with her. So I try my best to keep up with this woman. Let's call her Pinky. And my legs were feeling miles. So I started falling behind. And just at that moment, the running app on my phone screams out loudly from my pocket. Distance. Eight miles. Pace, minutes per mile. And the pace was actually pretty good. To my surprise, Pinky actually slowed a bit and turned to me and said, Wow, eight miles. I was feeling pretty proud of myself for passing you, but I'm just getting started. There's no way I could keep this up for even two miles. Bravo. Now what I want to talk to you about today is how remarkable it was for Pinky to admit her head start. She certainly could have ignored the announcement, kept on trucking, and left me thinking that I had just been left in the dust by one speedy grandma. But she didn't. She owned up to it, she admitted her own limitations, and she restored my confidence in my own abilities. Now, how many of us are starting life with a giant head start and never recognize it, or even worse, having recognized it, never have the courage to acknowledge exactly how far ahead we are. In my work with corporate leaders, this question of head start is an important one. Because if we blindly assume that we are all starting from the same point in life, that constrains our decisions about hiring and promotion, our decisions about diversity and inclusion policies, and even our ability to identify and meet the needs of new clients in the potential markets. Another effect of this ignorance or arrogance about our head start, or let's call it privilege, is less obvious but is being increasingly observed in psychological studies. Now, Paul Piff, Dacher Keltner, and their colleagues at Berkeley have observed that as socioeconomic status increases, unethical behavior increases, and empathy decreases. Put another way, for more the more privileged you are, the less you care about other people, and the more likely you are to believe that greed is good. Now, these study results are particularly important to me in my work with corporate leaders because how many low socioeconomic status CEOs are you aware of? If the privileged people in the C-suite are the least likely to care about other people and the least likely to engage in, uh, the most likely to engage in unethical behavior, then what hope do we have 
for corporations to engage in compassionate ethical behavior as they engage with their employees and the broader society. I aim to help executives to be kinder and more honest. But rather than saying to them, be nice, or don't lie, cheat, or steal, I have to use more subtle ways to help them to become more ethical and uh, more compassionate. Now, how do I do that? A first step is to, explain, is to help them recognize their privilege. And I do that first by explaining that privilege comes in many forms. Of course, good-looking, healthy, rich, heterosexual, white men are predominant in corporate leadership. And you may be thinking that this problem of privilege is limited to this group of men. I, however, place myself squarely among the privileged. As a graduate of Duke University and Harvard Law School, and as my brother likes to remind me of one percenter for most of my professional career, it's hard for me to deny that I have these obvious signs of privilege. But gender, race, education, occupational prestige, social class are not the only sources of privilege. We have many sources of privilege that we take for granted. So for example, you got a head start in life if you grew up in a two-parent household where both of your parents were mentally and physically healthy. And when I say mentally healthy, I mean by objective standards and not your assessment of whether your parents are crazy. <laughs> if you are able-bodied and have all five of your senses, then you are starting on the eight-mile mark in life. And if you have never experienced violence, trauma, social isolation, then you are running life's race with fresh legs. So after understanding that privilege can come from many sources, some purely the accident of your birth, and some the result of fortunate circumstances, the next step is to become aware of how precarious the uh, advantage that is conferred by these privileges actually is. Now for some of us, this awareness comes quite easily. As a black woman, all I need to do is go and try and rent an apartment in a posh neighborhood to see the skepticism or sometimes outright racism that, accompany, that, uh, that uh, meets me until I'm able to drop the H-bomb, which is a colloquial way of saying that I uh, let the realtor know that I went to Harvard. But other black people don't have this easy get out of oppression free card. So I recognize that the privilege conferred by my degrees and, and uh, my social status is quite precarious. For other privileged people, this wake-up call, this, this uh, recognition that their pr privilege is precarious comes from, for example, losing all of your money in a financial crisis, or a sudden and serious illness, or even the heartbreak experienced because of death or divorce. Now, for my overprivileged clients, they cannot easily change their race or their gender or their family background, and I certainly do not wish economic ruin or other catastrophes upon them. And so I have to trigger their awareness of their vulnerability, of the precarious nature of their privilege in other ways. I often ask them to identify one aspect of their identity or their experience that they're the most ashamed of or that they hide in order to avoid judgment or pity. 
And the first responses are often this generic answer, what is your greatest weakness? I'm a perfectionist or I'm a workaholic. But we push through. We actually um, explore until more sincere stories come out. For example, having come dangerously close to financial ruin because of a bad investment, or having been bullied as a child, or simply feeling that no one likes them because of who they are, but it's all that their people are only interested in what they can do for them. And then we, then we then confront these feelings of isolation or despair or helplessness. Now my goal in dragging these people, these men, down from their sometimes self-created pedestals is not to take delight in their suffering. My objective instead is that through their suffering, they will recognize the ways in which, though sometimes shielded by privilege, we are all vulnerable to exclusion, persecu persecution, and greater catastrophes. Now, when faced with this recognition, most people choose one of two options. Either they try to minimize or eliminate all sources of personal vulnerability. They seek more money, more power, more favorable rules, a bigger head start for themselves. Or they internalize the responsibility to lessen the impact of privilege for all of us. They seek greater opportunity, more progress, more equitable rules, a redrawing of the starting line for everyone. Put simply, People choose to act out of fear or out of gratitude. Fear leads them to grasp tighter to the illusion of control, while gratitude leads them to release their sense of entitlement and embrace interdependence. Now, most people realize that holding on to this illusion of control has already contributed to an exhausting hypervigilance. Accepting randomness or vulnerability as a part of the human condition allows them to invite compassion from others and to show compassion, whether through shared stories, more generous and inclusive policies, or more socially responsible business practices. Now, I feel comfortable taking my clients on this journey towards compassion because I have had to take it myself. I used to hide very carefully the fact that my mother died when I was 11 years old. I did not want the inevitable expressions of pity that came when people learned the news. I adopted this fear and control approach to life somewhat unconsciously until at some point I faced a professional challenge over which I had very little control. I suddenly found myself very vulnerable and had to return to attend to the little girl praying over her mother on the kitchen floor. I finally asked myself, what did she need? And what she needed, what, what I needed, was to share my story. And somehow magically, as I began to do this, I met people who had also lost parents as a child. And we were able to provide each other with mutual support and empathy and my compassion for myself and for others began to grow. I suddenly felt less alone and less fearful. Now, I'm older than most of you in this room. I'm not going to lie to you. Life can be scary. Life is random and it can be rough. But we all get through this together. In fact, Maya Angelou put it best in her poem, Alone. She says, there are millionaires with money they can't use. 
Their wives run around like banshees. Their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone. But nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. I hope to spread this message here in this room, but also in the C-suites and the boardrooms. And that's my simple plan to change the world, one corporate executive at a time. Thank you.